Hello, and welcome to Follow Your Curiosity, where we explore the ups and downs of the creative process and how to keep it moving. I'm your host, Nancy Norbeck. I am a writer, singer, improv comedy newbie, science fiction geek, and creativity coach who loves helping right-brained folks get unstuck. I am so excited to be coming to you with interviews and coaching calls to show you the depth and breadth both of creative pursuits and creative people, to give you some insight into their experiences, and to inspire you. In our last episode, I talked with actor Paul McGann about he and his brothers got into acting, some of his early experiences as an actor, and a whole lot about his experience as the eighth doctor from Doctor Who. This week, we continue that conversation, getting into what's different about recording audio and how lockdown has changed that process. And when we finally emerge from the Doctor Who rabbit hole, mostly, his thoughts on Richard E. Grant, Jodie Whittaker as the Doctor, some of his earlier television work, and why he left social media. Here's the second part of my conversation with Paul McGann. I did want to ask you, I mean, because there's there's such a huge difference between doing audio and doing actual video, TV, movies, whatever. And and yeah. I'm wondering, you know, when you first started doing Big Finish, I don't know how much, if any, you know, audio only you had done before that, if that was like a, a huge shift. It was a bit of a shift. I, well, I worked, because uh, I was trained to do it in radio drama. You know, we still have a that that is in in the UK, you know. There's still a BBC still has a. You can have a career in radio here, right? As an actor, you know, there's lots of radio drama made all the year round. I've done a few radio plays, but the, but the, but they're you know studio based things. It's only later they you know you go out in fields and shoot. With, you know. But but back in the day, there were you know it, um, you would do. Um, you know, you serialisations of novels, classic this, Shakespeare, that you do stuff on the radio, you know. So, and I'd, I'd done one or two of those things and quite enjoyed it. Uh, it was quite strict, actually, an old. It still is. It's rather. It's rather an old-fashioned. No bad thing for that. It's rather an old-fashioned thing to do. You know, the way the way that radio, radio plays are still made here, um, and presented and enjoyed and consumed. Um, uh, but but somehow the audios, first of all, beginning on uh, in the early two thousand and working on Big Finish, immediately felt like qualitatively different, physically different. Uh, not least, for example, the, the 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 Big Finish studio, the main Big Finish studio in London, uh, in West Ten, is uh, at the Moat House. You know, we we there you have. Uh, isolation booths with glass windows in them. Uh, now I'm only saying this because this is how it works. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and uh, again, this was this this is only this is this only happened because digital recording came in. Whereas before, you know, in analog, you've all got to be in the same room, and you know, it's like it's a sound stage. Whereas in whereas once you get digital and you're all on different channels, you can be in the same space, but so long as you're isolated, you can see each other. This is how we make big finish to to this day. We're all in the same room, but in these little sort of wooden <laughs> plywood rabbit hutches with, <laughs> with windows, you can also you can shout your head off on your channel and throw your arms around. It's great. It's it's comical, um, you know. So so it was a different vibe. It was a different way of working, um, and of course, you know, almost immediately you were making box sets, working quickly. Uh, you know, with a radio play, say you're doing, I don't know, a, a, a Dostoevsky, whatever it is, an adaptation of a novel or something, uh, that might take three days in a BBC studio. Whereas, you know, with, you can do a script, a whole big finished script in about six hours. You can work really quickly. So that was different. Uh, and we picked it up and ran with it and modified it and have, have made it uh, the way we want where we wanted to to make it so i guess in answer to your question i now i've forgotten what the question was um it was it what yet it was different to, it was different to anything um that i'd done to that point yeah um and no bad thing for that uh it's a great way of working it's a great way of working and but again differently we, we do some more next week i shall be sat in this chair next week and we'll go on Zoom or whatever it is, and we're gonna we're gonna do another box set, 
uh, from our houses. And so, you know, what an age we're living in. That's amazing. I, I just saw their email about, you know, the yeah. one that they just did with Tom Baker. And I thought, really, you did it over, yeah. you know, Skype or video or whatever. But well, I, don't, I don't know about in North works. America, but, but already here we've seen there are already visual plays out. Plays have gone out on TV uh, that actors have made at home. I saw Sheridan Smith uh, in a TV drama that they'd made over either on Zoom or something else. Uh, they've already aired. They're, they're mm-hmm. already, you know, oh, it's fantastic, this, isn't it? You know, you know again, it's, it's the spirit of the age. You know, you can, as soon as, it, all it needs is for somebody to have the idea, get the thing yeah. written, get everybody at it, get everyone involved. Uh, the actors can rehearse it. They have to drop a load of gear off at their front doors, apparently, in this recording gear. Um, I read about it in the newspaper. And then they shot it, or the, you know, or spouses and whoever partners are mm-hmm. operating, operating the camera. Um, and suddenly you got yourself a TV drama. You know, this is how it's going to be from now on. I like it. It's, it's amazing how, you know, when you're forced to rethink how you do things, it magically happens. You know, you come up with stuff like that. It's just when you see what's possible and, and perhaps, you know, part of the, of course, it's got its disadvantages, but, may, but maybe the simple advantage that you, is that you can, you, you're forced to, in a way to drop anything extraneous, anything mm-hmm. really that you, that might have just been there for effect or, you know what I mean? It's, it's, uh, yeah. I know when we initially, when we did the, the, the Doctor Who audios, we were learning how to do it while we were doing it. You know, then this is how it should be. That's part of the thrill, you know. And then get, I know Big Finish. Big Finish are fond of saying, and it's and it's and it's always been true, you know, that that, that the, if you like the business model that Big Finish operates with, is the more you buy, the more we can make. Essentially, mm-hmm. that's it's a simple thing. Um, so it's so it's grown its own audience, it's found its audience, and now it's I won't say it's boom time, but it kind of is, you know, uh, particularly since the fiftieth. Uh, and people in the United States in their droves suddenly started listening to Big Finish, buying Big Finish, and that's changed everything. And, you know, even just seven or eight years ago, we might meet once a year, twice a year max, to do, to do a bit of Big Finish. Now it's five times a year, four or five, you know, and they're box sets and then. And you we're know, all so grateful to you for it. But, but likewise, <laughs> it, it cuts both ways. But, but the thing is, but, but in a way, it, the quality, because, um, and again, Big Finish would say this, and, and, and it's true, you know, that, that it's, it's a circular advantage. Mm-hmm. It, means that, it means that more writers can be invited in, better things can happen, the quality of stuff, you know, can improve, you know, uh, the audience burgeons. It's fantastic, you know, uh, because the appetite is, is insatiable for these kinds of things. Oh, yeah, you know, definitely. Long may it continue. Definitely. And, and I have to say, I, I sat in on the uh, Chimes of Midnight tweet along, listen along, whatever they called it last oh, week, funny? which was a blast. Um, it was a little bit tricky trying to keep up with everything in time to figure out which comment went, went with which moment here and there. Yeah, but, it- but it's still it's sort of like you catch what you catch and it's, and it's all great. And you were definitely throwing out just the most hilariously random comments. <laughs> I remember because I was having, cause, cause I, cause I'm not on social media. So I was having, and they said, Oh, don't worry. You know, we'll, we'll figure out a way. So I was having to text somebody oh, who was then, yeah. So who was then having to tweet immediately what I text. So, so, he, in, so, wow. so, the, so there was even a delay, I suppose in that, um, I can tell you too that it's the first time I've listened all the way through to a big finish audio. Really? Ever. Because you know, when you do stuff, you don't watch you them don't, or listen. Yeah. You don't watch them. Why would you want to? Right. You don't watch you don't watch them or listen to them. And that's um that that literally it's only when it was over, I thought, I've just listened to a big finish in its entirety. Well, that's interesting because Rob Shearman hadn't listened to it or, or thought about it much, aside from people like me talking to him about it at conventions, in 18 years. So it was very interesting to watch his reaction to things, too. Like when he, you know, he'd said early on that he had modeled the house in his head on the one that he lives in. And then uh, toward the end, he said, oh, my God, I just realized I live in Edward Grove. <laughs> 
No way. <laughs> Yeah. I sent him a message afterwards. I said, good luck sleeping tonight now that you yeah. figured that out. Your sins will find you out. <laughs> but it's true, you know, most, most of us, um, because there's really no need. I mean, obviously, technically, you, you will, you know, if you, if you shoot something, of course, you'll have to watch it, say, to, to fix it or put voices on or ADR stuff. Mm -hmm. on. You're going to see, you're going to see footage. Sometimes you even see stuff um on monitors if there's a problem or whatever but but there's no unless you, unless you're a little bit strange you know and i'm i don't want to speak for every performer in the world but there's really no need to watch the thing you did or listen mm -hmm. to the, the thing you made um so it was actually quite it was kind of great i think because of the distance it had been so long um and it's a little like a to do it, I know because I've I've, see, I've actually seen with Nell and I, and I've seen another couple of things that are films that I've been in, um, and it's years later, and, and it has the quality of um, I don't know, getting out a box of photos or something, or holiday mm -hmm. snaps or something, um, and you suddenly you're and to watch a film, say you can't, you're not following the story, but you're looking you're looking slightly to the left and look like you would with an old photo mm -hmm. and seeing what's in the background and going, Oh my God, I remember that. I remember that night we did that. And I remember where we were staying, but you know, so it's all kind of, uh, it's kind yeah, of, yeah, you have so much more than what's on the screen. Yeah. 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 So yeah. it's, it's like I say, so initially it's pointless watching stuff because you can't really watch it. Uh, cause you can't follow the story. Um, and anyway, you're in it. So, um, but anyway, it's a long way of saying I, I did, I really enjoyed, um, Chimes at Midnight. It was funny. It made me laugh. It's such a great story. I it's mean, it's one, it? yeah. I'm I'm one of the you know people who listens to it every year at Christmas because it just seems like the thing to do. Which I know <laughs> Rob kind of says, Thanks really. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> but I have to tell you, there was one comment that I sent to a friend that somebody made while that was going on, and I don't remember which which moment it was. But I read it and I thought, oh, that's so incredibly true. Someone named John Arnold on Twitter said, McGann has a magnificent line in sarcasm that only Davison of the other doctors really matches. And I thought, that might be why they're my two favorites. <laughs> do you think, do, do, did, did, now, was he talking about what the character in, in the audio, or was he talking about the, the smarmy sob that was tweeting? Or which was he? No, I think he was talking about the audio. Good for him. And and I have to say, there the line about. Um, I guess I should preface this for people who are not familiar with the Chimes of Midnight. There are, are servants in this house who keep dying, and then they keep coming back to life, and they they die in strange ways. Mm. And the presumption is always that they've committed suicide, even though that's clearly not mm. possible. But when the uh, when the chauffeur dies, and they say, "Oh, surely it's suicide," and I don't have the whole line in my head, but you know, yes, obviously he went out, got the car, ran himself over with it, and put it back outside. It's just that's what I'm thinking of when I read that tweet. It was like, yeah, that's that's perfect because it's so so deadpan, so perfectly Eighth Doctor, and so totally fitting with that entire. Yeah, play. yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah. The lowest form of wit. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I think when it's done that well. <laughs> so, since you mentioned Withnail again, I'm curious because you sort of kind of, well, you didn't really revisit it, but you and Richard E. Grant did a short film maybe a dozen-ish yeah, years it. ago. Yeah. And I'm wondering what, what it was like for the two of you to, to do that. Because wasn't that also for handmade films? Kind of think it was that was for a re it's kind, of, kind of weird reconstituted handmade handmade went out of business but yeah but yeah handmade took over it and uh <clears throat> the short um and i think it took us two three days to shoot it and it's the only other time that he and i uh got to work together you know since <clears throat> since with now um, I've never seen it, but I hear it's it's good. You know, I mean, it's it's an old one, isn't it? Did you have you it, ever seen it? It is. I have seen it. It's called Always Crashing in the Same Car, and it's if I remember because it has been a while. I think he's yeah. 
if he's not the prime minister, he's somewhere near that and accidentally hits someone. And I think you were his advisor trying to tell him how to stay out of trouble or perhaps get him into that's it a little right, bit. That's right. That's right. Yeah. He, he kills somebody. Mm -hmm. uh, um, he dry, he, he, he drives over, he's driving too quickly at night in London and he, and he knocks somebody down, but he, he, it's a hit and run and he doesn't stop. Um, and there's, I think there's some, you know, it's an important time. There's an election coming up or something. And his, his, uh, his right hand man, his advisor says, don't worry, I'll take care of it. You have to do this though. You have to say this. And so, uh, so it's about that kind of skullduggery. The title comes from a David Bowie song on, um, low just to fill you in always okay. crashing always <laughs> crashing in the same car and but that dates us but um <laughs> and it certainly dates me and richard no but i've never seen it maybe i'll maybe i'll see it one day um maybe i'll see it one day didn't he someone said he richard that is played the doctor he did twice 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 so he was in the Stephen Moffat um, Red Nose Day parody, The Curse of Fatal Death. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. For yeah. about two minutes, maybe. Um, and then, and I have to say, going back to what we were saying before, The Curse of Fatal Death is like a perfect example of writing carrying the day, considering that back when they did that, and I don't remember exactly when it was, but definitely before the series came back they had to you know borrow a fan built TARDIS console and whatever in order to do it but then he also did the scream of the Schalke which I think they it, it was an animated story Derek Jacobi was in it as the master but he was sort of like that doctor's companion slash yeah. who was a robot complicated android yeah I, i'm not really sure where that came from but somehow it seemed to work and i think that they did that around the same time that they did shada at least for the web when they did the animated versions i think they were up together oh, so it was that long ago it was so a good long while ago yeah 50, about 15 years maybe mm -hmm. or, or even wow wow well you know he and i we never discussed it we've never spoken about it um I mean, that's not unusual. I'm just saying that uh, he, <laughs> he, but he kind of, he just sort of did it. He didn't, he didn't even mention it before he did it to me kind of thing. Um, I'm, I'm just saying, you know, just, yeah, so he's it, definitely it went, like, so, so I was never sure, you know, if, uh, cause, cause they're things I've never seen. So, yeah. Um, so he's really the, the doctor who gets overlooked and forgotten because he was technically the ninth doctor for like two hours. So he's the and, guy. And that he was the, it. He's the him. one. It's him. He, it's him. It wasn't me. It was him. He's the one that. Got, yeah. Okay. Well, good. That suits him. You were neck and neck there for a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He, he can wear, he can wear that one. But how was it when you got together to do the short film later on? Was it kind of like you'd never been apart or was it? Yeah, totally that was different? good. That was good. Um, uh, he, it was intense, you know, the story was intense. It was quick. Shorts tend to be. Um, and, but I can remember we just enjoyed it, you know. Um, mm -hmm. it, felt, it felt good. I think I'd persuaded him to do it. So I felt kind of responsible. Um, uh, and I was glad that he, you know, aside from a few little, grumbles he, he i think he enjoyed it as well um and then it was gone you know mm -hmm. yeah but like i said it was just a day two days if that and um i wonder if we'll ever work together again i hope so, so. i think we're good at it i mean we can mm -hmm. you know we, 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 we were good at it then anyway yeah together. he was actually very good and he was terrific you know, he plays kind of unraveling panic particularly mm, well. Yes, know. he does. You know, he does that really well. So hey, go on. No, I couldn't. <laughs> well, since since Shada came up, I am I am wondering what since that story was originally written for Tom Baker, was it at all odd for you to step in and 
and do it. I know sometimes when I have listened to it, there are definitely lines that I can hear that I'm like, yeah, oh, I can hear Tom yeah. Baker saying that. And yet they, they also seem to work just fine for you. So I don't know what it was like on your end. I can honestly say that at the time it wasn't, I didn't think of it because I, I, because it was new to me. I didn't, I didn't understand the, 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 the connection or the import of it. It was only afterwards when it was explained to me that this in fact, did, you know, um, of course I was, someone had mentioned it, before. this had been a, a you know, a, a TV script, but uh, in answer to your question, no, it, I, I didn't, it was only afterwards that people would say, don't, you know, um, don't you think it's strange? And and uh, I had to have it. Ex yeah, I had to have it explained to me then. Yeah, you know, uh, and and questions like the one you've just asked then, you know, were asked at the time. Um, but I can honestly say at the time it wasn't something I was even I was even thinking of. And the thing is, when you, you if you do Doctor Who, um, particularly if you play the Doctor, of course you're stepping into people's shoes anyway. Um, mm -hmm. That's what it is. You know. You, you know a few people have done this before it's or, or you might be it could be a shakespeare play you're playing something that loads of other people have played it's just a fact of life you know so you tend in a simple way you tend to try and block all that stuff out and just do your own thing you know try and make mm -hmm. just recoin it refresh it so um but no i didn't think of tom at all um, I, I think it's interesting because afterwards. it is you know i mean it's a douglas adams script which is part of why it's so great and again, for people who aren't familiar, it was something that it's they started working story. on in the in the seventies, yeah. and then there was a strike, and that was the end yeah. of it. So it was never yeah. never filmed. Though now they've done the animated version that I think may have some of the actual footage from the seventies in it. I'm not sure because really? I haven't seen it. I think so, yeah. But um, but in any case, so when they couldn't get Tom to come back for Big Finish, they gave it to you. But I think it's a great example of how, you know, the doctor is still the doctor. Like the doctor has different personality quirks in each regeneration, but fundamentally it's it's still the same character. So it worked beautifully. You know, they just retooled Romana to be president, but other than yeah, that. When, you know, again, right coming right to the present day, what the first when Jody's first episode screened, uh, and I sat and watched it. Um remembering you know rooting for her i had no idea what it was obviously what it was going to be like um but it did make me remember those first few days in vancouver and you know other other people who played the doctors spoke of this you know of, of similar things it's like you know you can't help but be nervy because there's a lot of pressure on you you know uh, again for this reason you're stepping into some big shoes um and those elements of characters you know the characterizations that have gone before you um you know it can be quite a pressure uh, and it's in within five maybe even less fewer um minutes jody i looked and just thought wow she's cracked it instantly she's hit the ground running she seemed she arrives fully formed when i, I guess the point being when we when we when i know when i did it thomas said the same thing I remember watching um, Matt Smith, even Capaldi, um, who had all that time to think about it. Mm -hmm. it took, and I, I get it took a while. It took, of course, it would. It takes. It seemed to take a little while before the the quality of the writing meets the quality of the act, and then the thing you know takes off from it. Mm -hmm. Jodie seemed instantly to be complete. Now that's that's in my view. Mm -hmm. And um, has never looked back. <laughs> she seemed, you know what I mean. The, the, I don't know if you agree or not, but but I just thought, oh God, wow, how is she even doing this? She seemed to, to possess and have, and in a way, kind of channel and let you and reveal, to, you know, elements, fragments of air, all of the things that um, that had gone before, and just completely have it under control and just be doing her own thing. What a joy. It's you know. interesting because the one that made that impression on me was Matt Smith. I think because I was, when I first saw a picture of him, I, I, I'll be honest, my initial reaction was, oh, you have got to be kidding me. <laughs> what are you, crazy? You know, it's, it's, like, like, it's, like, it's like casting David yeah. Bowie. I mean, you know, Matt's a, Matt's a certified alien. You know, well, yeah, it was like this so, skinny, so skinny 12-year-old. Yeah, what are you thinking, you know? But, but by the time the opening credits on his first episode rolled, I was like, okay, I'm in. I'm sold. I'm, I'm, 
I'm good. That was enough funny there. Whereas you know? I, whereas I didn't think that, and I, I thought, it, I thought it took him a couple of months. Isn't that funny? But there you go. It's in the eye of the beholder. Yeah. And, I, and again, this is how it should be. You know, I remember thinking, I remember months in, um, thinking about Matt. That's it. That's it. That's it. How? What? And it was almost as if whoever was running it, then it was almost as if they had to catch up with him rather than. The well, that could be. Because um, he has that energy for sure. Yeah, but yeah, you know, so like I say, the quality of it, and and that's to be expected. Whereas, you know, like I say, uh, I didn't think that at all with Jody. I just thought, you know, that I, I, I really enjoyed, I and mean, then perhaps because, and it helped at least for me. I can only talk for myself. Uh, it helped that the episode was set on Earth, because mm-hmm. um, I kind of enjoy it when the Doctor's on Earth. I mean, I enjoy watching it and listening to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and there it was, and they were in Sheffield. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? And, uh, and she was, you know, and, and uh, anyway, it worked. It worked for me. Mm-hmm. It, it really worked for me. Um, there you go. But it's like you say, there we are. It's in the eye of the beholder. Well, and I think really, you know, the the most important thing for that show is that you get the doctor right. You know, everything else can be falling apart at the seams and barely held together with bubble gum and duct tape. But if you have the doctor right, and they have, they yeah, have. well, and and I think that's what I what I learned from your TV movie. You know, because there were so many things that were kind of like I don't really know about that bit, and mm. I'm not sure what this bit's about. But they got the doctor right, and so it's all okay. <laughs> so, yeah. So yeah. 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 And, well, and do I remember correctly that you were up against one of your brothers for that? Well, when we did the... For the doctor. Well, back in the day. Yeah, I was. Yeah. yeah. But he wouldn't have known that and I wouldn't have known it either. Okay. At the time. But it only emerged later. Uh, and I think now even you can, somewhere on YouTube, I think you can see the the little um, audition tapes that we Yeah, made, I think so. You know. But then we... But, but, but then he we would only have been among scores of actors that were doing the same thing um you know it wasn't just about us you know so there wasn't a rivalry between the two of you well we well, <laughs> well no it was actually really unusual uh in retrospect that he and i might be considered for the same thing my own theory about that and only phil siegel can refute this uh but i've and I'm not joking. I think both of us were called in because Phil couldn't tell us apart. <laughs> you know, Phil, Phil let me know that uh, the reason that I was considered for, for the doctor initially was because he had seen in 1994, when the only time that me and my brothers worked on a, on a, a film serial, on a TV serial together, and it aired in '94. The Hanging uh, Gale. The Hanging Gale, uh, and it was it was an Irish famine story. So you're in the 1840s. I play the priest. I'm in this long frock coat. My hair's long. It's doctorish. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And Phil says, you know, he, wherever he was at the time, you know, probably in North America, he was, he was watching, and he said, "Who's that? Who's that? That's my that's my doctor, kind of thing, or whatever." He, he'll tell the story better than me. But but um, when it came to it, a year later. He couldn't remember which brother it was because we look alike. So <laughs> I think they trawled. He said, you, you, said you, better, you better get them all in. Um, that's the reason. It's so funny that you say that because I remember, and, and this will undoubtedly say something about me, I suspect, but oh well. I remember watching the Catherine the Great movie that you did. Oh yeah, around the same time. And there is a line in there because... I think it's Mark and Steven are also in that. Yeah. But they're not supposed to be related to your character. But there's this line somewhere in there, and it's been so long since I've seen it that I'm probably completely misremembering. But it's something along the line of, you know, somebody's like, why are they coming after us? And it's like, because you all look the same. <laughs> and we were all in the same room. Yeah. Because they can't tell you apart. That's Because they can't tell us apart. Simple as that. Simple That's as that. That's fascinating. In fact, we went, I think we went straight, that year, we shot that Catherine the Great thing in 94, and we went straight from that to Ireland. 
uh, as I remember, in that spring uh, and shot the hanging girl. So they're, they're contemporaneous. They're, they're, you know, it was the same. It was the same period, the same year. We worked together a lot all that year. And that was a project that, that you all came up with together, right? The Hanging Gale? The Hanging Gale was something, yeah, that, that uh, my brothers, Stephen and Joe, had uh, had the idea for. Stephen ended up writing up into a document that eventually the BBC picked up and ran with, and it became this, uh, yeah, this six-hour film serial, um, loosely based on the, on the story of our own ancestors, um, mm-hmm. these these famine Irish. Um, so yeah, so so, um, so we got to shoot uh, that for the rest of the year in Ireland. Uh, and unbeknownst to me, like I say, somewhere when that went out, <laughs> a, 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 one Philip Siegel is watching them and um, my life is never going to be the same. No. And, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, but isn't it funny? That's just how things were. Yeah. But, but, but I know that year there was already, I remember that that time, there was already talk uh, every now and again, you know, that, oh, you know, they're planning a Doctor Who, you know, Doctor Who's not dead at all, you know, and the, uh, it's going to come back one day. And, and, and sometimes you'd hear, well, it's going to be an American, you know, um, whoever, you know, someone's yes. going to do it. Um, or, you, you, you know, you'd hear, I remember distinctly hearing, um, you know, Eric Idle is going to be the doctor. Mm. And, and someone would say that, and you'd go, oh, wow, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, God, I can yeah, see I can that. See, I can see that. Mm-hmm. You know, or Rowan Atkinson, or you'd go, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, God, that would make sense, you know. And then you wouldn't hear anything. So, but, but it, that's just normal. This is, this is what goes around, you know. And Doctor Who, of course, is something, even to this day, you know, it's rumours and rumours and rumours and rumours, um, most of which never transpire. So, um, but, but surprisingly, then suddenly we're getting a call whenever that was, 94, um, 95, 95. And there's a real script, you know, and there's a real casting agent. And suddenly, you know, will you come in and, you know, and there it is. Uh, and even when Phil, when it began to solidify, like I say, everybody went in. It's just one mm-hmm. of those things, you know, the stacks of actors. So uh, we all went in. But when, when they began to, when it began to get serious, and my agent's going, actually, you know what? They want they, they want to talk to us now. You know, they want to, uh, you know, they're really, you're on a short list and it's getting serious. And um, and then suddenly it stopped being a lark. I mean, in the, you know, just in, in that professional way. Mm-hmm. Um, and I started thinking, really? <laughs> uh, and, and, and I was quite, I was mystified. Well, I, I was, I, I thought, well, hang on, whatever, what happened to Eric Idle? What happened to, <laughs> well, yeah, you know, because why are they coming? Why, why would it be someone like me? Right. Who's, who's not a comedian and who's not a, not one of those actors like, you know, Rowan Atkinson, Eric Idle, whoever, these, these, these brilliant comedians. Um, why are they? So, and then I remember then conversation, when I first met Phil Siegel, I asked him that question. He said, don't worry about it. Don't worry about <laughs> it. You know, you know, it's you we want. And I, you know, can I, and I was trying to talk him into talking me out of it, or or, or whatever. You know, we, oh, wow. it took, yeah, it took weeks and weeks. I couldn't see it. I couldn't see it. I, I was, I didn't, I was nervous about it. So, well, hang on, how's this going to work? I don't do that kind of thing, you know. Isn't it funny? <laughs> Isn't it funny? Yes, you do. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, and he was, that's what Phil would say. Oh, you do, because uh, I've seen it. And I'm going, well, you know. And so it took weeks and weeks, and, and uh, he wore me down. Wow. Uh, yeah, that's how it, you know, that sometimes has to happen. That's how it happened. Well, we're um, all eternally grateful for that, too. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> me too. Phil Siegel. I wonder wow. where he's locked down. He's locked down somewhere. Oh, somewhere. Yeah. Oh, wherever he's locked down, I hope his ears are burning. Because <laughs> we're talking about him. <laughs> so I've, I want to make sure, since, you know, we've gone down the who rabbit hole here. Yeah. But... There, there are two other things. Um, one that I feel like I should definitely ask you about is the monocle mutineer, uh-huh. which you know goes goes back a good ways. And and I think wasn't there even something about that where the DVD couldn't come out until a certain <clears throat> amount of time had passed because of the fact that it was this World War One story. Right. I don't know. I could be misremembering that, but I think there was 
I don't know that there was. I can't remember. Now we're talking mid eighties. Now I don't. I don't remember mm -hmm. that there was. Although it was a, it was a series. It was a big BBC series. It was, mm -hmm. a, it was, a, it was a big one. Um, you know, we all ended up at the Baftas kind of thing. It was one of those flagship things, uh, and it took us six months to shoot it. And um, it was, it was a First World War story, and I played the the, the young lead role in it. Um, but I don't remember. And while the 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 material and the reception of the of the of the film series itself. The way that the BBC put it out and publicised it and handled it, that was contentious for the then um, the then establishment, the then government in the country, who's um, you know we're talking so we're talking Thatcher's second government at, well, mm -hmm. at that time. So um, anyway, there was they they, they, they argued and rowed over um, the, the well simply the BBC the BBC was 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 then. When you made something in those days, uh, you know, you had the BBC, the, the company that would shoot the thing. Um, and of course, the BBC had an entity, a branch of itself, which would then publicise it. I think it was called Enterprises, BBC Enterprises back in the day. And this is a fairly new body. And, they, you know, they were charged with getting the thing publicised. You know, BBC is a public broadcaster, so it has to work slightly differently. To, you know, there's no advertising. So mm -hmm. anyway, so, the, so they would be, you know, when, when the time came for this thing to, to, to go out and near the date and all the publicity had to be dealt with, um, you know, they, were, they had to handle that. And, and this particular story, uh, this Monocle Mutineer, which had come from a, a, a late 70s piece of, a, a book written by two journalists, um, which itself was sort of contentious. And there's no footnotes in it, there's nothing, you know, and, and they were trying to tell a story. They were, you know, anyway. So um, this book was dramatized. And then, anyway, hey, look, to cut a long story short, when the BBC came to publicize this thing um, around the release, the way that it looked, if you open a newspaper, at the time, and I know because I've kept a couple of them. Uh, you know, they, they, they. I remember one, for example, there was a, there was in, in the big broadsheets of the day. You'd, you'd, you know, the Beeb spent money, and they they would have a full page, say, and it might be it was quartered into photographs, and it was production photographs, and you know, uh, it might be trench soldiers, you know, us actors playing these so. And there might be a, a, a sort of attendant. There might be a fact or something, a phrase written underneath, you know. And, 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 on, and it would say, like, again, I'm just remembering this now. So uh, it would say, you know, fact, you know, so and so, so many trench soldiers died, whatever. And then fact, mm -hmm. you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, that would have some something purporting to be a. They got it wrong because, you know, these things, the book, the, the, the initial piece of journalism wasn't, as it turned out, wasn't that factual anyway. Ooh. And so it's sort of, well, no, but it, or it wasn't that, it, let's say it wasn't that rigorous. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> you know you could you could easily challenge it and um and people did and then and then another remove you know that that, that ended up being dramatized and, hey, but they got it wrong which fell right into the trap of the then government whose interests were in you know rather in, rather in, in telling up and shouting up uh you know britain's glorious military history rather than having it impugned let's mm -hmm. say anyway Anyway, now I'm just getting too complicated, but but it, it, there was a row about it. Mm -hmm. um, but later on, people and, and the fact that it never got a, it didn't get repeated for years. Uh, you know, I think a, probably a you know, theories abounded around it that somehow it was being squashed, and no, it was. I don't I don't think that it was. It just it just didn't get a repeat. Um, anyway, it was a cause celeb. And it was the first thing, personally, it was the first thing that I'd ever played. It was the big break that for, for mm -hmm. me as a, as a young kid, you know. Um, and out of that, uh, because I was good in a hit. As there you go. Uh, I got with Nell and I. That's how that happened. Anyway, so, so we're going back to the beginning of the conversation. That's, so that's exactly how that happened. Um, I've never seen Mutineer since, and I don't know... Um, Maybe I will. Maybe I'll look at it now. It's been that long, but uh, uh, actually, what you and I are talking here on on what's 
uh, VE Day, 75 years. Oh my God. Uh, today's VE Day, Victory in Europe. Um, and that's making me think of that, you know. Yeah. Uh, because, I, you know, this morning here um, in England, you know, we had fly pasts and, you know, sort of lockdown shindigs. And um, obviously there were, there were big plans before the. the right, lockdown. right. Uh, they were going to do some street parties and the like. Um, so it's quite a day today. And anyway, it is what it is. Um, <laughs> Britain's one of those places. Yeah, no, I hadn't, I totally had not realized that, but then every day right now feels like every other day. So that's probably part yeah. of why. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, and, and I know you also did, again, I'm testing my memory here, but I, I know I'm some, mine. somehow, somehow I came across an, an audio or two from this, a musical version of Much Ado About Nothing. Did I? <laughs> I, I well, well if you if you've heard it I must have done it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. A, a musical version of much I I know I've I've heard a song or two from it. Unless I've uh, got the play wrong but I'm pretty sure it's much ado. Then it must exist. What do what do I what am I playing? I think you were Benedict. Stop it. <laughs> now I'm going to have to go look it up. Yeah, you are. I, I don't I'll have you know to what? see if I if I still I have it's absolutely no idea how plainly, I found an audio file, but if I've still got one, I'll send it to you. It's plainly one I've blocked <laughs> from, from my memory. But you know, the idea of a musical of Shakespeare like that just intrigues me. So, but if you you know, if I'm totally barking up the wrong it's, tree, that's it must okay. have intrigued me at one time if I did if I went and did it. <laughs> how funny! I don't remember a single thing about it. God, well, I'll must, see what I can find, and I'll. Send I must it be to getting you. old, but I, what I do remember is 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 the very first job I ever got as an actor. The day that I left the school that I trained at, um, and I had to leave early in order to get this union card. You know, because because being the closed mm -hmm. shop, you you had to find somebody who would give you a card. Right. And this this man who ran a little theatre company uh, in a place called Basingstoke. He said, come on, I've got a card, come on. Uh, and I said, what are you doing? He said, much ado about nothing. Uh, Maybe I said, that cool. Was it. I said, cool. <laughs> I said, what, what am I going to play? He said, uh, the old man. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was the oldest, Virgis, the oldest character in it. I was 20, 21 years old. Wow. Anyway, but, uh, but it got me my union card, so I went. I can remember yeah. that. Well, one would hope. <laughs> I can just about remember be that. Pretty important. Pretty important. So the other thing that I wanted to mention, especially because I remember you saying in November that that it was if if I'm not misremembering that that um, our mutual friend was your favorite part you've done, Eugene Rayburn. I think it was. Yeah, pound for pound. I think that's the. Yeah, uh, yeah. I meant it. Uh, you know, that, that was of all the things I've done you know, both making it, then seeing a bit of it afterwards. Anyway, look, it was just, it was the, it, it was the happiest time in that way. Um, you know, it was a close run thing. You know, there's, there's been other roles where I've been completely thrilled and happy um, and it's fitted, you know, you're lucky when that happens. Mm -hmm. But Rayburn was really something. That's my own personal favorite. Um, just to, to work in that way, to work with, you know, and there's David Bradley. David Bradley, of course. I was, know. Was in it with, uh, was and, in it all the way through. And David you know, Morrissey so, and Keely Hawes. David Morrissey, Hawes. Keely Hawes, you know, Steve McIntosh. It was a fantastic time. Um, a great company, but like, but that role, sometimes roles fit in a way. Um, that just at that time, at that age, the way that you're working, you're kind of ready for it. Um, you're trusted to do it. It just somehow just all just, it happens off the bat, you know, it just works. Yeah, I'm going to try too hard. Um, and even, you know, you might even, I, I, even down the years, I, I, which is really gratifying, you know, people who love the book have said, mm -hmm. God, you know, when I saw that, you were my idea. That was you. You, 
I thought I, I, I used, I'd worried they were going to mess it up, and then you were just right, you know. And that's a lovely, you know, because that's that ain't going to happen very often, right? Um, either, you know, people love people have ideas about characters in books that they love, and um, I know recently, I know because we just watched all twelve episodes uh, of Sarah Rooney's book, Normal People. Do you know this book? Do you, mm -hmm. Have you heard of this? You will. No. You will. It's it's the, it's phenomenal. Uh, it's just aired on the BBC in Britain. Uh, I think North America is going to get it. Actually, it's ringing a vague bell, so maybe... It's an Irish story. Okay. Uh, to, uh, young people. Anyway, and this book, was a, the, the novel 2017, I think, was fen was a phenomenon. Uh, people love the book. They love the characters. Now they're making it into a TV thing, and it's like, oh, please don't mess it up. You know, don't mess mm -hmm. it up. Every young actor wants to play the roles. It's the same. You know, it's one of these once-in-a-generation sort of uh, thrilling things. Um, and it worked, you know, uh, and, um, anyway, so, so, I, and it made me think, you know, uh, cause I know, cause I read later after I'd watched it, uh, that the young actors were saying, you know, uh, how people had said, you know, that they were afraid. And then as soon as they saw them do it, they were completely hooked, you know, that they, that they were, that they were just like the characters in the book. Kind of cause people are, people get you know, it's not possessive, but you, you in a way, you, we can't help it. We, we yeah. just can't help it. When, when you right. love something in one format, you don't want something in another format to mess it up for That's you. That's right. And, and it's nearly always when you've read the book, mm -hmm. you know, because the book, the books, of course, are, you know, by their nature, they can, they, they can, you know. They're a different animal. Well, it's an interior world, you know, you can, you know, which you can do on the page, you know, but when it comes to shoot these things, of course, there's, you know, it's, it's yeah. It's a trickier prospect, um, you know, and, and this, and I know, and of course, Rayburn in Mutual Friend, the book itself is so big. Mm -hmm. the, the adaptation, Sandy Welch's adaptation, she said by volume, she said, there's only about half of the novel in there. She said, you simply couldn't afford to shoot the whole thing. It would take you two years. Um, and these Dickens books are massive. So the, to, to her, her dramatization was a work of genius. But but the way that and it was it was Dickens's uh, last completed novel. Yes. Uh, Edwin Drood, he never finished, and and you know so this is thirty years, if you will, after the big his first big hits. You know he's he's middle aged now, uh, you know almost old. Um, he's been doing it a long time, and now but now suddenly it's another era, and the way of novel writing and the way of characterization. Of, you know, of character writing. Mm -hmm. Anyway, anyway, he apparently he later confided either in a letter or to a friend or in a conversation. He said, you know, there was there were elements of Rayburn, this Rayburn character, that were ne the nearest things to himself or elements of himself that he'd ever put down on the page. Anyway, so very gratifying. You know? um, so yeah, but yeah, a long-winded answer to a very simple question. That's all right. Yeah, yeah that was that was the that's the time <laughs> I yeah that was my favorite. That was the um, but you know what? I'm still hoping at some point in the future something else will come along that will knock it off its perch. Um, oh well. When you work yeah. as an actor, it's you have always to hope for that. It's always the next one. <laughs> it's the next one. You know. And now I'm 60 odd now, you know, so the next one's gonna have to be somebody's granddad or somebody's dad or whatever, um, or some old retainer. Um, but but you know, as performers, you can never. It's always about the, the the one that's coming. It's always about you know. Yeah, it was nice that I did that thing, but mm -hmm. the next one's going to be the one, definitely. So, what is the next thing? Do you have any idea? Since the whole lockdown thing has started, because I know it's not like anybody's filming anything. No, well, like I said, we're doing um, we're doing audios. I'm doing audios, right? But, you know, we're all doing those. Um, even in the normal run of things, the way that I work, and I'm I'm a, I'm a bog standard typical professional actor, um, as I described before, often the first you hear of something is the week or two weeks before they want you to shoot it. So the question, what's happening next for you? Which often we we do get asked, you know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we don't we don't know. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen next. Talk to me in three weeks. I might be on something. <laughs> I might be doing something. Uh, that they might tell me about tomorrow or tonight. I don't know. Uh, but certainly productions have stopped. Um, I know that, you know, Wes also were being asked to self-tape for things. So 
notionally anyway, things that, you know, obviously the film companies are looking to pick up again in the, in the autumn. Um, but, you know, watch this space. I don't know. I don't know what we're going to do. Um, I'm just locked down here, having a nice time. Like everybody books. else. Yeah, reading books, yeah. talking to you, <laughs> staring out of the window, which is what actors do when they're not working, incidentally. <laughs> Stare out unless, the window. <laughs> unless you can stare out the window, wait for waiting for a telephone call. You can't be an actor. That's what you've got to learn to master. Good to know. Yeah. Good to know. Though I did see that uh, that Richard E. Grant is out refilming bits of With Now at the moment and putting them on Twitter. Stop it. <laughs> is he? Because yeah. like I said, because I'm not on Twitter, I don't see these things. I wouldn't know. See, um, I thought you were. Were you and you're not in I was. No, I was. Ah. And I, got, I, got, I got away from it. Um, and I'm glad that I did, actually. I, I was on Facebook, I was on Twitter, and um, and then I stopped. Uh, it must be 18 months, two years now. Okay. Uh, I was, I was avid. I was, it was taking up a lot of my time. It uh, does that. And I don't mind admitting that, you know, it wasn't, a, it, was a, it was actually a certain book that I read um, about this very matter. Um, it was Jaron Lanier's book, uh, 10 Arguments for Deleting Your Social Media Accounts ah. Right Now. That short book. Lanier, I don't know whether you know about him or not, but you know, he's a, he's a bit older than I am. He's a, he's a tech pioneer, you know, still works in AI. You know, he's a public intellectual in the States. He's a brilliant writer. And, and um, anyway, he read in this short book, you can read it in one sitting, uh, which I did a, a year or so ago, um, the day after I, I deleted my social media accounts. And then oh. back and say, and again, and perhaps many people would say this, but um, I'm, I suppose I'm typical. Uh, what his book made me realize, which, and, and I realized that I had an inkling that it was true anyway, mm-hmm. that, that, that just the very, the act of doing it, the way that I was doing it, the way that I was consuming it, the way that I was taking part was actually riling me and making me just, yeah. just the kind of asshole that uh, you don't want to be. That I didn't want to be. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it wasn't until that reading Lanier's book, and I, you can read it for yourself, I'm not going to even, I won't spoil any of it for you, except to say that uh, it wasn't until I, till I, I read his description of it, I thought, oh my God, he, he's, that's me. He's talking about me. And he was saying that it, that it suits a certain um, cohort, people out there, uh, to rile you in the first place. Mm-hmm. It's, only, it's only when you're riled that you become interesting. Let's just say. Anyway. Yeah. Well, it's and, engagement, uh, right? Well, not only that, but, the, but there's a commercial aspect to it. You know, um, mm-hmm. uh, he, he opens the book by, in the first page, on the, in the first paragraphs. Uh, you know, this man's a scientist. You know, he's, he's not, this isn't idle stuff. He, uh, and he's in, the, he's in the industry that he's talking about. And he's talking about some of his friends and he says how the biggest personal fortunes that have ever been made in history are being made now, right now. I can believe that. That's how he begins it. And, and these fortunes are being mined and made uh, on and off said, of all of us. Let, let me tell you how. <laughs> anyway, so he, he persuaded me, he got me away from it and I, um, and yet, you know, my family uh, still do it and enjoy it, but they don't seem to 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 do it in the way that I was doing it. They don't seem mm. to. It, it's not it's not pulling at that same thread. I I plainly shouldn't have been doing it. Um, I miss it sometimes. I miss the kind of you know. I miss the information, and I never know mm-hmm. what like like like, like I, I wouldn't know what Granty's doing because I'm not on Twitter. Well. Um, I, I've you know. got, uh, there have been a couple of little news stories, so I'll, I'll send you a link because, yeah, yeah, there's there's the bit in the phone booth and he's got, you know, one where there's a cow in the background and the cow wants to go down. Yeah. Well, bless and him. he it's inevitably good. cracks up at the end of them. It's hysterical. <laughs> well, that's great to hear. Maybe I'll get one of my kids to show me one of them. Uh, but that's good. That's good to hear he's doing that. That's generous of him anyway. Yeah, well, I think, you know, everybody is kind of, doing their own thing to amuse themselves and try to amuse other people right now. But he's out there having, he is, he, he's that he's, but he's of Richard is one of the best enjoyers I ever met. Um, and that's a lovely thing, you know, 
because it, it's never guaranteed, you know. Mm-hmm. It's like it's like half the world lacks natural enthusiasm. You know what I mean? There's something just the, the world's the world. Richard, though, doesn't. Richard is, is a great enjoyer. He really just wants to, you know, and it's infectious. Um, and it's a lovely spirit, you know. He can wind you up as well, let me tell you, but um, <laughs> like like no one I ever met. But 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 he's you know, he's he's hugely generous and he's and he, like I said, that um I'm not surprised to hear that he's doing that because he um he, he loves it, he enjoys it. Yeah, he's clearly having a great time. He's having a ball, you know. And I remember seeing um, you know, a uh what was the film he was in a year ago? Um, you know, he he got nominated for an Academy Award for it. Anyway, I saw the trailer of it. And it made me laugh, you know, because I could see, if there's one actor to another, I could see behind the eyes, he was mm-hmm. having a ball, you know. He was having a ball. And then, and then you cut later to the, and then when they uh, shot, the, when they, um, uh, the Oscar ceremony, you know, there he was, you know, and, and still having a ball, you know, he's mm-hmm. grinning from ear to ear. You know, come on, it's, this is how it should be. Absolutely. This is how it should be. If you, can't, if you can't enjoy that, what are you doing, you know? Yeah. Make something out of it, you know, even when you're locked down. Might as well. Yeah. Anyway, I hope, I hope his ears are burning now more than <laughs> Phil Siegel's. <laughs> well, you'll have to tell him to keep an eye out for this podcast. We've been at this for two and a half hours. You realize <gasps> that? <laughs> well, let's stop then. <laughs> I mean, I'm having a great time, but I feel like I should let you go. Okay. So. I, I should let you go too. Thank you so much for doing this. This has been so much fun. That's it for my conversation with Paul McGann. McGann fans will know that there is plenty we didn't get to, but we had such a good time that we decided to do this again next year, and I promise we'll dig into things like Hornblower, Luther, and Paul's stage work then. I also want to let you know that I wasn't misremembering Much Ado, but it turns out it was a concept recording rather than a full production. If you want to give it a listen, there's a link in the show notes at fycuriosity.com. I can't thank Paul McGann enough for sharing his time so generously. And thank you so much for joining me. If you enjoyed this episode, please do share it with a friend and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks. You can find show notes, the six creative beliefs that are screwing you up, and more at fycuriosity.com. I'd also love for you to join the conversation on Instagram. You'll find me at fycuriosity. Follow Your Curiosity is produced by me, Nancy Norbeck, with music by Joseph McDade. If you like Follow Your Curiosity, please subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to tell your friends. It really helps me reach new listeners. See you next time.